I know there was there was one march uh, here in Boston that uh, my children marched in, and they told me about a moment where they they got to the edge of the highway and they ran into a wall of policemen, and um, the the group that was in the front was a Latino student group, and I think and then my kids are African American. I think they were in the group behind that, and the Latino students turned and faced the crowd and said, "White allies to the front, please," and they shifted. And the white allies can't because because that makes the police stand down usually. Usually. And so now I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Jabari Asim is an author, poet, playwright, and associate professor of writing at Emerson College. For 11 years, he was an editor at the Washington Post, where he also wrote a syndicated column on politics, popular culture, and social issue issues. And he served for 10 years as the editor in chief of Crisis Magazine the NAACP's flagship journal of politics, culture, and ideas. His previous books include A Child's Introduction to African American History, Preaching to the Chickens, Only the Strong, A Taste of Honey, and What Obama Means. He'll be joined in conversation this evening by Adrian Walker, a Metro columnist for the Boston Globe, providing commentary and opinion on local and regional news, as well as society and culture. Tonight, they'll be discussing Jabari's latest book, We Can't Breathe, on black lives, white lies, and the art of survival. In their starred review, Kirkus calls it a collection of essays that go wide and deep into the black experience in America. Asim places current events within the context of a legacy that is literary, political, cultural, and racial, with a voice that is both compelling and convincing. We are so pleased to host this event here at Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jabari Asim and Adrian Walker. It occurred to me that because the book is so new um, that we'll be talking about it and most of you haven't had the opportunity uh, to read it. So I thought I'd read a couple of short pieces from it. Uh, there are uh, eight essays in all addressing various topics. Uh, this first uh, short excerpt that I will read is from an essay called Getting It Twisted. Uh, which was excerpted earlier in the uh, Yale Review. And it's, a, it's about what I call a narrative combat, which we can uh, talk about uh, a little later. It's time to replace the timid discourse of pragmatic centrism with the aggressive language our situation recall, requires. Unlike Barack Obama, who spent both terms of his presidency hamstrung by conventional notions of propriety, and understandably wary of coming off as an angry black man. The rest of us have license to speak freely and speak out. It is a very grave question as to whether or not the slavery and degradation of Negroes in America has not been unnecessarily prolonged by the submission to evil, W.B. Du Bois once observed. Replace the archaic sounding evil with blatant corruption. And the question applies not just to black people, but also to any American who's not a member of the gilded 1%. As I watched the 45th president and his lackeys attack the tender flesh of opponents with claws fully extended and fangs dripping saliva, I can't help thinking of Benjamin Franklin's words to his sister, Jane. If you make yourself a sheep, he wrote, the wolves will eat you. Uh, this is from an essay called The Elements of Strut which sort of addresses the experiences of inhabiting a black body in public spaces. Um, and this little passage is right after I've had a discussion of a dancer uh, named Little Buck and the jazz genius, Louis Armstrong. Unlike Little Buck and Louis Armstrong, most of us can't trip the light fantastic or transform trumpet solos into miracles of sound and feeling. We are left to rely on others in the struggle to rouse our bodies and spirits into motion. When I stagger from my house, still groggy with sleep, I turn to the generous gods of bop and groove to help me get my hustle on. I pop my earbuds in, press play, and soon I'm walking down the street like Bernie Casey and I'm gonna get you sucker. My theme music guiding my feet. My playlist is subject to the twists and turns of my fickle tastes, but some tunes never lose their favorite status. Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs, Grooveyard by the Montgomery Brothers, Steppin' by the World Saxophone Quartet, The In Crowd by the Am Ramsey Lewis Trio, The Sidewinder by Lee Morgan, Giant Steps by John Coltrane, Soulful Strut 
by Young Holt Unlimited. My playlist propels me through public spaces where my presence might be questioned or challenged. One August morning, I was walking with earbuds firmly in place when someone called out to me. I turned and saw a white cop standing in the middle of the street, the sun glinting off his mirrored sunglasses. You doing laps, he asked. I told him I was. Which lap is this? My second, I replied. He gave me a thumbs up. I nodded, unsmiling, and went on my way. I couldn't tell if he was just being friendly or letting me know that I was under surveillance. This is from um, an essay called Of Love and Struggle, The Limits of the Politics of Respectability. And I've just commented on, uh, we just saw it a few days ago, whenever um, some kind of atrocity or transgression has, has been committed against an African American, one of the first questions they're often asked is, do you forgive the perpetrator? And uh, I think most recently we've seen it in the case of the nine-year-old boy in New York who was accused of groping a woman when his backpack brushed against her. That was one of the first questions he was asked uh, after she apologized. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I laugh to keep from crying. <laughs> Perhaps forgiveness is politically expedient in settings where a numerical minority could otherwise get little done without further bloodshed. But if it makes sense to sometimes forgive as part of a larger political strategy, it does not function so well as a method of advancing moral consciousness in the United States. The founding framers had already staked a claim to the nation's moral imagination long before the hunger for captive black bodies reached fever pitch. They polished their Enlightenment-flavored philosophies about morality and the dignity of man while building an economy on our ancestors' backs and making a concerted effort to cripple their spirits and minds. This was, of course, a long strategic process. In addition to murder, it involved rape, starvation, sleep deprivation, forced labor, mutilation, poisoning of food and water, and denial of access to spiritual materials, techniques most of us will recognize as elements of systematic torture. With hypocrisy, greed, and cruelty woven so tightly into the American fabric, a campaign to improve the country based on an ostensible moral consensus seems Sisyphean indeed. While honorable as a motive, moral suasion is ultimately insufficient as a tactic. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is, you wear more hats than anybody I can think of. You're a professor. You write children's books, you write adult books, you're a critic, and now you're an essayist. Yeah. Tell us about the genesis of this book. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it came out of conversations with, with a few people that I knew, um, and I had been thinking about uh, writing a nonfiction book, because my last couple of books for adults were fiction, and I kind of wanted to return to nonfiction and, and see what was happening uh, in that arena. And I just... Uh, arrived at a set of essays. I decided I want to try that form. I'm a huge fan of essays. Um, I, read, I read them like, you know, some people read the sports pages. So um, I thought it was time to dip my toe in that water. Interesting. So this is the first, first collection of essays? Yeah, I edited a collection of essays some years ago called Not Guilty, uh, 12 Black Men on Life, Law, and Justice. Uh, and I have one essay in there, but I was primarily the, the editor. How long did it take you to write the eight essays? Um, Less than a year, because um, you know, I had a deadline. Once you have a contract, <laughs> uh -huh. about that. Ed editor starts saying, so when are we, when are we gonna see that? Just checking in, that's what they like to say. <laughs> Get an email, hope all is well, just checking in. You know, yeah, right. it's like, oh, okay, I guess I, guess I better get to work. The subtitle of this book is On Black Lives, White, Black Lives, White Lies, and the Art of Survival. And lies and deception is a theme that turns up often mm -hmm. in these eight essays. Why were you drawn to that? Well, I've, I've always been uh, struck by uh, what I call um, narrative combat. Uh, Samuel Huntington uh, has kind of posed a lot of our cultural questions as a clash of civilizations. And I see it as a clash of stories, right? So uh, that's how I tend to look at the universe. And so one of the things I've often looked at is stories in particular involving African Americans and other oppressed people and how if you happen to be in those communities, they're often so false as to be laughable. But then when you look at the degree to which they've pervaded the belief systems of other communities, you, you can't laugh. 
right? And so I think as a writer, uh, my natural impulse is to resist that. Um, Toni Morrison calls it a, a master narrative, right? And a master narrative for her is not a, a race-based scenario, it's a power-based scenario, right? So, and I don't disagree with that, but one of the things I'm really struck by is, is this clash of stories. So I came up with the phrase narrative combat because I'm always looking at the way, uh, for example, when um, a black person, an unarmed black person is shot by a police, the narrative immediately becomes uh, an attempt to criminalize that black person. So that even well-meaning people in the majority culture will say things like, oh, the policeman was just doing his job. Well, if, if the uh, victim, if the dead person um, were innocent, why did they run? Yeah. You know, these sort of things. So I, I, I sort of see it part of my role as a writer is to counter that narrative. Well, look at the guy in Dallas who was shot sitting in his own living room. Yes. You know, and two days yeah. later, you know, they'd found some weed. Right, 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 exactly. So, I mean, we could spend our entire time here this evening <laughs> yes. cataloging there are a few these, examples these, these of particular yes. And that's actually one of the issues we, I talked about with the editor, you know, in, in terms of timeliness. Um, and I said the sad reality is anything that we write about in this particular manuscript will have been repeated and perhaps even exceeded by the time the book comes out. And that's, that's the reality. Self-deception is part of what you're writing about, too. Absolutely. In the guise of respectability and, you know. Yeah. And what you were just reading, talking about in the last essay. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll give a couple of quick examples. When I, when I look at self-deception, I, I often look at myself. Uh, I look critically at how I behave as a black person who's often in spaces where I'm the only black person or one of two or three black people. And that has been my experience since I was 10 years old. Uh, so one of the things I look at is the degree to which I have internalized uh, some of the most harmful aspects of white supremacy, how I police my own body in spaces, uh, and, I, and I, I look at that a lot. Um, and I think related to that is this politics of respectability, this idea that uh, if we uh, shower regularly and moisturize and have Colgate whitened smiles and speak a language, uh, a vernacular that's commonly referred to as standard English, then we will be seen as who we actually are, that we will be fully accepted if not embraced into the majority of culture. and. Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that actually happens. It certainly hasn't been my experience, and I'm closer to 60 than I am to 50, uh, and that has not been my experience. So I'm also kind of chiding myself, right? right? So it's like if I behave a certain way, it makes me a little safer, not necessarily, right? So I'm looking at the ways that white supremacy has not only affected uh, what we might call the majority culture, but the way it's affected the rest of us, Right. The easiest way to look at that is to look at myself and my own behavior. Right. In Seen and Being Seen, you write a little bit about your formative reading experiences as a child. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that and how you came to be this writer in the first place. Um, yeah, I, um, in that particular essay, The Seer and the Scene, yeah, uh, yes. shout out to Ralph Ellison who has an essay called The Seer and the Scene. The nerd in me had to point that out. <laughs> Uh, the, the essay is about, uh, I'm responding to, um, at, at first I'm responding to an essay uh, by Nancy Larrick that came out I think in 1965, which was called The All-White World of Children's Books, which, which looked at children's books that had been published at that time. And uh, she was a white librarian, she was president of the International Reading Association, and she was calling for children's books that feature children of color. Um, and I entered school a couple years after that, but one of the things she, she, she said, and I think she um, overestimated, I think she exaggerated. Uh, she talked about the psychological harm, harm that would be imposed upon children of color by not seeing themselves in children's books. Um, and I look at a children's book that was published in 1947 that was in my first grade classroom at the time I was attending an all-black school. It was called Two as a Team. Um, and I couldn't find another uh, similar picture book featuring children look like me until 1962. So from 1947 to 1962, I could only find one book. Now, she's right, there need to be a lot more books, but one of the ways I'm pushing back gently at that narrative is that I think she overestimated the vulnerability of black children's psyches, right? So I, I argue that through the power of my imagination, I was able to place myself in stories where I wasn't invited, and at the same time, I could also look out my window or walk down my street. So she's talking about the need to see healthy reflections of oneself, which I endorse, but I argue that in my community, there were healthy reflections of myself everywhere I turned. So I want to kind of really sift through that particular narrative. Um, 
And I, I guess I, I did talk, but to get back to your question, I did talk about how I became a, a reader in that context. And I, so I examined the, um, the textbooks, the reading textbooks that were used in St. Louis public schools. I grew up in St. Louis, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, yeah. Um, that were um, the standard text was the Holton Mifflin Reading for Meaning series uh, for like first graders through third graders. And I mentioned in the essay that I sort of had an advantage in school because my dad was a school teacher and we had all of those textbooks for like the first four years of school. So I actually read them while I was in the first grade. So it was all, it was all very familiar territory to me. And the teachers would go, wow, you're really grasping that story. And I would just go, thanks, I'm, I'm doing my best. <laughs> but the truth is, I, you know, I, I had had access to the material. Yeah. yeah. You're cheating a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, privilege, right. That's exactly right. There was something in the last essay that I want to read, Ew, if I can. And it's about f this whole idea of forgiveness mm -hmm. and oppression. And I want to get back to that for a second. Sure. Do oppressed people have an irresistible impulse to forgive? Does forgiveness free us from some larger burden, enabling us to cope with a larger struggle? Or perhaps it keeps the hot coal of anger from burning our palms, as the Buddha would have it. Loving our oppressors is so much a part of the African-American consciousness that to question it is to risk censure of the harshest kind. It's a form of masochism, kissing the sword that has just sliced you open. Talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want That's to That's a powerful image. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, the other thing I compare it to is, is being in a relationship with a batterer, you know, and, and someone who wants you to stay in that relationship. Uh, I remember I remember actually hearing this from time to time when I was a child that, well, um, he hits you because he loves you. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, we, in that in the larger scenario in which we find ourselves in the country, we are repeatedly beaten. Um, and I question the logic of assuming that that's indication of being loved. That's all. Um, and I want to be clear, um, I believe very much in love, but I believe in requited love. I'm selfish that way. I tend to love people who love me. And I don't think it's the best use of my energy or my emotions to uh, devote much energy or thought to loving people who clearly don't love me. I don't hate those people, but I'm watchful. I think that's the price of my safety and my freedom. You say later in the same piece, I don't believe love can conquer injustice. Yes. Yes, I do not. What can? What can? Yeah. Um, I argue that strategy has a fighting chance. And if, we, if we're going to put our energy towards anything in terms of, of overcoming injustice, it might be putting our brains together instead of our hearts. Just want to shift the, the sure. orientation a little bit uh, in that regard. Right. Mm -hmm. What's next? For me? Yes. Uh, I have a play. A terrible question to ask someone <laughs> who's Hey. Last book just came out last week. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, I was I was at a reading one time, uh, and I'm gonna swear, so I apologize in advance. Uh, I was at a reading in Chicago once of the um, poet and novelist Sapphire, yeah. right? And uh, I think her novel Push had just come out, and someone very innocently raised their hand and said, um, "What do you have? You know, what's what's coming next?" And she said, "Shit, man, I just finished this fucking thing." <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask her a question, but I just read the <laughs> I got nothing, nothing. No, no. Um, I, I well, did. I used to be an editor, you know. That's yeah. always the question. What else right, you got? Right, right. Show me something. Show me something. <laughs> uh, I, I do have a uh, a musical. We're doing a concert staging of a musical that I co-wrote uh, called Brother Nat, which is inspired by um, the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831, Southampton County, Virginia. That's next Thursday at the Paramount Center. Uh, and Emerson's campus, uh, so that that's coming up. I have more information about it. If anyone is, is interested in attending, please come. Please fill the seats. Uh, and I have a number of books uh, coming. See, I happen to know you always have three <laughs> things going. So. Yeah, I, I have uh, my first collection of poetry comes out in the spring, and uh, I've I've been privileged to be fairly widely anthologized as a poet. So I did some cheating there. I collected a lot of work that has already appeared elsewhere. Added some new material to it. So that comes out in the spring, and um, I've got, I think, four, four children's books in the works. So one for middle school, one, two for um, two picture books, and one uh, baby board book, which com comes out first. That comes out in the fall. N <laughs> not, often. <laughs> not often. Not often. 
I think this is a good time to open it up to the questions from the audience. Let's go. Strategy over hearts. What's the strategy? Well, here's the thing. Um, Chinua Achebe said writers don't give prescriptions. They give headaches. So I'm very comfortable with my role <laughs> in pointing out sources of pain. Uh, and I do defer to strategists. I don't pretend to be one. I'm a person who pays attention, takes, takes notes. Uh, there's that Mary Oliver poem, Instructions for Living a Life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell the world about it. That's my role. Uh, I think there are people far more equipped to come up with sound strategies, but I think we need to pay attention to them and less attention to people who are talking about forgiveness and love and justice rolling down like a mighty stream and, and this sort of thing. I, I think those are platitudes that comfort us and certainly comfort me. But at the end of the day, I don't think they're, they're moving that needle that much. Um, the, the title of the book is very powerful and, um, and some might say like sort of risky to, to, to use these very powerful words. So I was wondering how you decided on um, that. The title came after the manuscript was done, uh, but, but one of the essays, Getting It Twisted, uh, discusses narrative combat, and particularly the work of a writer named Ronald Fair, an African-American writer from the, the 60s. And I argue that he's a criminally underappreciated novelist who often wrote about narrative combat. So I discussed two of his novels, both of which uh, pivot on the shooting of an unarmed black man by police, right? And this is set in the 1960s, right? Uh, so, and one of them is called We Can't Breathe. So I kind of connect that to, uh, obviously, uh, Eric Garner, uh, then, you know, try to, try to show a continuum between the 60s and the present. And after the collection was done, I kind of decided on that name because it also works metaphorically in terms of the constrictions that we're up, ag up against as oppressed people. I have, uh, a, a like you said, your words are, for me, are disturbing. They've stuck with me. And this whole idea of inhabiting, the, you know, the whole notion of being in a black body and being inhabited and having that be everywhere mm -hmm. and shaping everything. It's a context, everything. So that's something that um, I'm thinking about a lot. I'm not certain what to do with it. It is disturbing. Uh, and my question is, the language, the, the conversation that comes from that, you know, so there's conversations that haven't been had if you don't have that experience of it happening in black body. There's a whole, right? There's a whole conversation. There's a, it's like a parallel universe. I'm wondering, have you thought about what are the conversations that might be missing or could be had in order to engage in narrative combat? Well, one of the things I think about, you know, we often talk about uh, the difficult conversation. That's sort of a, a, sort of a pet phrase uh, right now, and we need to reach across racial, racial lines and have these conversations, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat averse to that idea. I think that, I am too. yeah, I yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I think that to a certain extent, Black people, you know, I, I think I can speak comfortably. Um, since 1619, we have been having that conversation. Um, and the progress we've made as a result of that conversation has been sorely and severely limited. And I, I think that there are, there are people who have responded well to that conversation, people in other communities and if other ethnic groups whom we might call allies. So I think the next step is to take the results of that 400 year conversation back to their own communities and have that conversation with their own people. Um, I, I say it somewhat flippantly, uh, but one, one of the things I often say, I'm kind of half joking, uh, is that if you do inhabit that dark body, it doesn't have to be a black body, African, African American, but a, a visibly different body. If you inhabit that body and you're in a workspace and you go to work um, a couple days after Thanksgiving, it's really hard to avoid uh, one of your liberal progressive friends coming up to you and saying, you won't believe the Thanksgiving dinner I had. My uncle's racist, and he said this, this, and this. My grandfather's racist, he said this. And this. I do want to ask white people in the room, and, I, and I, I do this in the spirit of humility, 
and compassion to not have that conversation with your uh, dark colleagues when you return from Thanksgiving uh, this year. It doesn't enrich us. It doesn't help us. It doesn't spiritually sustain us unless you say, and this is what I said in response, and this is how I'm going to commit myself for, until the next Thanksgiving to reducing this type of attitude and this type of uh, delusional behavior and delusional commentary. So I do think that difficult conversations are, are necessary, uh, but I, I think it's, it's time to sort of tilt that in a different direction and, and have it not so much be where we are the envoys of this progressive attitude or this very still somewhat revolutionary notion that black people are fully human. You know, we, we've been kind of making that argument with our lives since 1619. It's time for someone else to take up that mantle. I'm not going to, in particular, devote my energy to that particular argument because why would I? You mentioned strategy, the brain part, coming yeah. from management. Strategy follows an objective. And an objective, you ask the question, what is? So let me dream a little. No white people, just African Americans. What would the objective be and what would the strategy be? If it were just African Americans? Uh, the objective would, I can tell you what it would not be. And what it would not be is that proving that we are worthy of uh, being recognized as human beings, uh, proving that we are worthy of the rights and privileges and immunities of citizenship. Uh, and I would start there. What, what would you do with it? What would I do with what? Once you accept that, you got it. What would you do with it going forward? It's almost beyond my capacity to imagine. And I have a pretty muscular imagination. I think it's almost beyond my capacity to imagine what that what that world would look like. Uh, so I would be hesitant to speculate. But if it if it always breaks down to power, you know, power is going to be divvied up different ways, whether it's white black, yes. black black, yes. male what you know, female etc. So if the bottom line is power. Mm -hmm. That's why, in a sense, I agree with you in terms of the strategy being uh, mental instead of emotional. You know, that's the only way we're gonna, um, you know, get that. You know, yeah. we become balanced in that sense. So. Yeah, and you know, and I said, so I said when Tony Morrison says, you know, the way she outlines it, it it happens to be about race where we are, but it doesn't have to be about race. It's usually about whoever's in power wanting to stay in power, and that's true if all the people are black, if all the people are brown, etc. <laughs> I just want to, I guess I'm, I'm really interested in the idea, this is kind of, this is a conversation about this kind of strategy versus love thing, because I think, I'm wondering if you can kind of elaborate a little bit more on that, because I don't think what you're saying is like not to love. I mean, I think that if you are doing the work that you are doing, it's because you love black people and are writing these books, you have. but um, I think, is it like more so talking about the way that love is weaponized as this kind of empty, like just like lying down and die quietly? Not that like there's something wrong with love, or it's inferior to thoughts, because yeah. that also becomes a very gender thing of like all well, emotion and it's like not effective. And, yeah. Like, the yeah. Logic is what they're saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about like what, how you see um, kind of like the radical act of loving black people versus like the way that, you see what I mean? Like I don't mm -hmm. just elaborate this on that. Yes, yeah. Um, and I, I, I do write more at length in the, in the book about that to say, you know, I'm, I'm not in any way opposed to love. I think love is powerful and amazing, but it's most fulfilling to me when it's a two-way street, when, it, when it's a mutual exchange. So um, yes, I, I believe very much in, in, in love and I, I believe in faith. When you ask me about faith, my faith is in black people uh, specifically, which is not to say I don't believe in any other people. You know, that's not the case. Uh, but coming from my own experience and knowing what we've uh, endured, and survived and, and overcome, you know, um, our, our elders called it making a way out of no way, right? I mean, it's a spiritual, it's, it's a platitude, it's everything. And, and I continue, it's a continual source of marvel uh, for me. So yeah, so it's not about despair, it's not about hate, you know, it's about being clear-eyed, I think, uh, and, um, and being grateful and receiving of love when it is, is sent in our direction, it's a wonderful thing, and I think we should return it. But I just, you know, I, I don't want the conversation to always be about that. Um, I'm thinking specifically right now of the Charleston Nine, uh, when they were slaughtered um, in Charleston in the, in the church, and how the, the press conference became a litany of testimonies and avowals of, of praise and gratitude and thank you, and et cetera. And none of that, you know, is, is necessarily 
wrong, but I thought it was misplaced. And I thought, for, let's, let's talk a minute about what we've, we've lost here and then calculate based on the loss and, and loss prevention. How do you shift from writing these essays to uh, writing your children's books and writing your picture books and you know, going from these very, very hefty topics where your audiences have either experienced this or are invested in learning about this to talking to such a new audience who might not have these experiences and hopefully like with the work they do should not have those experiences yeah. later on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's funny. Um, I got a, an email maybe, maybe about three weeks ago uh, from a woman who met, you know, you have these friends on social media, but you've never actually met them in real life. <laughs> so I have this friend on social media who's a reporter for the New York Times. We've never met. And uh, one of my board books has a new cover. It's kind of has new covers coming out in March or something like that. So I posted the cover, and she sent me this note. She was just so excited. She was blown away. She was like, um, I had no idea you were the same Jabari as him who wrote the children's books. <laughs> She said, I can't believe it. I can't believe you wrote this book. And, and it's funny uh, because people say, well, you know, what, what's your most popular book? Is it the N-word or, you know, was it your novel? And I say, no, actually, it's something called Whose Toes Are Those? <laughs> That's my best-selling book. It's for babies. Same guy. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I wear a lot of different hats. I think the children's books uh, emerged organically from my experience as, as a father. My wife and I have five children, and I had to entertain those children, <laughs> get them to bed, make up nonsense rhymes, that sort of thing. And, and you know, eventually my wife and I had conversations, well, you're, you're a writer, you make up these silly rhymes for the kids. Those should be books too. And I say, yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, so that's, that's, that's kind of how it happens. It's not, it's not as dramatic a shift as one might imagine, you know? Writing for six-year-olds has to be a little different. Um, it's, it, it isn't hard. I'll tell you what's hard for me is reading to six-year-olds. I think they're a much tougher audience. And, and I don't think I do that as well. And also in picture books, I mean, we have to acknowledge the illustrator's the rock star. You know, I'm just kind of there. It starts with me. And I'm a little resentful about it. <laughs> but it starts with me. I got a few typewritten sheets of paper, and then you know later it becomes this beautiful picture book, and I can't you know I can't draw, so I can't do that part. But when I do a visit, say with children in the company of the illustrator, the illustrator takes over the room. You know they just they own it, and I'm just kind of I'm here too, and the kids never have any questions for me. <laughs> I, I I did a, a one with with one illustrator, and he's he's drawing something that looks like nothing the whole time he's talking to the children. It's just, swirls and I'm like what is he doing what is he doing and then at a certain point in the presentation he turned it upside down and it was a wonderful piece of art he had drawn the whole thing upside down while talking and the children were like <gasps> <laughs> and I started quietly putting my stuff in my bag and I, was like, I can slide out no one will ever notice that I was here because I, I got nothing in comparison to that nothing at all so it's a challenge Hi. what are you reading right now Ah, oh, wow. Um, I'm reading a memoir uh, that hasn't been published yet. Uh, I have an advanced copy. It's called Womanish. It's a collection. It's not a memoir. I misspoke. It's a collection of autobiographical essays called uh, Womanish by Kim McLaren, who's a, a wonderful novelist and essayist and my colleague. And, and because we worked together, I was able to get uh, an advanced copy. Um, and you'll be hearing more about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm about 90% done with it. Uh, and it's lyrical, it's clear, I'm learning things. So, and it's, and it's called Womanish, which I think is a pretty cool title. Do you read fiction? Um, you know, I do. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird with fiction. Uh, probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, when I'm working on fiction of my own, I can't read other people's fiction. If I'm working on nonfiction, I can read other people's nonfiction. And one of my projects that I'm working on is fiction. So I'm not reading a lot of fiction right now because, I don't know, there's not room in my brain for other people's characters right now. So it's kind of odd, but that's the way it is. Question over here. Um, I was curious about the structure of the collection. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could talk a little about the choices that you made um, in terms of the ordering and how that may have had anything to do with time and content um, for editor. Yeah, um, so I decided what all the essays would be before I wrote them. 
right? So I kind of gave myself like working titles, which which change. I think uh, Getting It Twisted was originally called The Official Story, right? So when I was working on it, that's what it was called the whole time. Um, and I guess in the, in the course of doing the proposal for the editor, um, so two of the essays appeared previously. Six I wrote for the book, right? So I, I, in my proposal, I put together a table of contents and said, these will be the essays. These are the likely titles. And I had a paragraph or two about each one. Um, and I, I never shifted them from that original uh, proposal. And also, I write out of sequence, right? So I do work on more than one essay at one time, whatever I'm thinking about. And the last essay in the book of Love and Struggle, I wrote the ending of the essay before I had written most of the essay. And after I read the ending, I said, I actually want that to be the end of the book, right? So, I mean, I tell my students uh, to start with uh, visualization, see the book on the shelf, see your name on the spine, <laughs> imagine the books on either side of it, right? And once you've got that really crystallized in your imagination, work backwards. So I kind of do the same thing. So uh, I look forward to reading your essays. Uh, it sounds like you're saying in a lot of different ways, rather politely tonight, but <laughs> you know, it's really about time for white people to work a lot harder to understand what it's like to live and not be white. You know, so yeah. I appreciate that. And, I mean, I don't absolutely, I mean, I only have Little, my little life to lead, but I don't, mm. I don't have conversations either, but I appreciate it. And oh, thank you. Thank you. Make me think. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a tough conversation because usually you end up having the conversation with white people who are actually, who are actually pretty supportive of our struggles for, for full equality. And I, and I think there is the other white people who would never listen to me, who would dismiss me um, immediately upon seeing me, seeing what I look like. Um, I think those the only the only people those white people will listen to are other white people, and and I, and I think that's where the shift has to take place. If you could amplify one voice in history that you feel is underrepresented, who would that be? Um, you see, I, I don't know. Amplify the question was if I could amplify one voice in the street, what voice would that be? Um, yeah, I'm not sure the amplify. Is the right word because I guess the argument I'm always making is that those voices are out there, those voices are already expressed, and, and well, maybe amplify is the right word. We're not listening. None of us are listening, um, and so one of one of the voices, and again, it's a collective voice. It's not an individual voice. Um, coming from an African American community, I would say it's African American women. I mean, if you look at say the electoral results around the country, on on any level, they're at the forefront. They're making the right decisions. Their voices aren't necessarily taken seriously. We thank them maybe for an hour after an election, right? And then, and, and then we move on. And occasionally I post, you know, when I'm in a puckish mood, I occasionally post on Facebook, what will happen if black, black women get tired of saving us? And I just, <laughs> just leave that question and I just kind of walk <laughs> away from it, you know, because in election after election, you know, their, their, their record is unerring and remarkable. They are not the women who are voting for Trump and Trump supporters, right? So I would say those voices. Uh, we, sh we should listen to the thought process, processes behind the actions uh, that result consistently in the polling place. I would add to that, <clears throat> based on your beautiful answer, to Ron Burke, every time yeah. someone talked yeah. on TV about hashtag me too, they actually referenced the woman who was sitting down with a young teen, a young black female teen, describing her rape, and that was the moment where Trump decided Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think it was other black women on social media who kind of said, uh, you know, actually this comes from Tarana Burke. Because in, in the original media uh, treatment, she wasn't present. And, and even uh, when one of the big glossy magazines did their cover, they had her on the inner flap. It's like she wasn't there. It's like rendering her invisible. And that's a way of altering the narrative that I'm talking about. I have a question you can interpret and answer however you want. 
towards a philosophy of Afro-pessimism. And so if you want to say anything about that. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Afro-pessimism is, is um, you know, I, the, the, the writers that are um, sort of called Afro-pessimists, I don't know if they call themselves that. You know, so, so I'm, I'm a little I'm a little leery of, of getting, but I know what you mean. Um, it, it certainly was a conversation around Ta-Nehisi Coates's book, right? Saying, well, that's the difference between Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and Baldwin, as if there was one difference between them. Um, yeah. You know, is that is that he totally despairs? He has no he has he has no no hope, um, and and I don't think that's true. I think that's a misrepresentation. And I think when people ask me, do you have any hope? Um, you know, the first thing I say is Baldwin, right? And I, and I I'm really hesitant to quote Baldwin in a room full of white liberals because Baldwin's low-hanging fruit. And, and you know, white people turn to Baldwin all the time um, to the detriment of the multiple centuries of other really brilliant black voices that speak at least as eloquently as Baldwin. Uh, but Baldwin said despair is a luxury only white men can afford. And, I, and you know, I, I'm, I totally don't believe in despair. Uh, so I'm, I, I would not uh, associate you know, because I've already gotten that question. Well, are you a pessimist, or you know? So you deny being an Afro pessimist? I, absolutely, I absolutely deny it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I, because I, I believe in black people. You know, very, very obviously. Uh, but in terms of teaching it, I mean, you know, I, I teach other writers who are African American, and I think it's just useful uh, to put a different experience in the center of the narrative, right? Um, and and that's what I do. So one of the things I'm really fond of is not positing the African-American essayist as an African-American essayist, but as an American essayist. That's why I, I, I really make that argument, which I get from Ellison. You know, Ellison kind of made that argument all the time. You take blackness out of the American equation, Ameri Americanness as we understand it doesn't exist, right? So I always kind of want to push that. Expand your notion of America. It's like when the media says working class Americans and they're not including anyone of color, right? So you always want to push back against that. And when I say media, present company excluded, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's I, I think, um, you know, I, I remember uh, reading an essay uh, when I was an undergrad in a book called Earthquakes and Sunrise Missions by Haki Matabudi, and the, the one thing that I pulled from is that there are people working day and night to stop your future. And at the time, I thought, man, this is some overblown, you know, what, what, you know, he needs to just relax. And <laughs> wow, dude, you think about this all the time? How do you sleep? You know, this kind of thing. Uh, but you know, it's amazing how much the phrase comes back to haunt me, right? But one of the things I think about are the ways we push back against that. And and uh, I think it's remarkable. Uh, and you know, sometimes I say the black body, sometimes I say the dark body, because I'm thinking of of. Um, different kinds of bodies that are visibly different. You know, visible difference is something that I talk about a lot. Uh, but to inhabit a dark body uh, and then to do miraculous things with it, right? To move, to move through space with such rhythm and grace and gesture um, kind of blows me away. Um, and sometimes I think it's a, it's a deliberate thing. You know, it's, sometimes um, I see people moving with such power and it's almost in inverse proportion to their lack of power. Right? It's like the less power I have, the more I assert myself with my body. I mean, that's one manifestation of the strut, right? But there are many others, and I, I talk about that a lot. Um, cause, and I, I write about dancers, because I'm kind of fascinated with dancers, because I'm a terrible dancer. And I, but I really marvel at people who essentially speak with their bodies, right? And, and when I look at, at dark bodies kind of moving through space with this great vivaciousness and exuberance in spite of everything, uh, and sometimes it's a deliberate survival strategy, and sometimes it's just a reaction, right? Uh, but all of it fascinates me. And in that essay, I try to celebrate it as sort of a manifestation of power because, um, you know, a lot of these bodies move in ways that most bodies can't. I'm also from St. Louis, and I wonder, how do you go back home and have these conversations about being written off as, like, coastal liberal elite? <laughs> as, as not being written off as what? Coastal oh, coastal liberal elite. Uh, no, it, it, it's, it's interesting because, um, may, I, may I ask what part of St. Louis you grew up in? Uh, 
I know where, but I can't describe where. Kind of down to like King's Highway ish, Southampton. Kings Highway, Southampton. Yeah, it says so. That's a that's a manifestation of our generational difference because no one with our complexion lived in that area when I was growing up in St. Louis. It was so racially uh, divided. But I grew up in the inner city, St. Louis. Uh, that's where my people are. It's the north. It's North St. Louis. I grew up in that stretch. New York Times did a piece fairly recently where they talked about Syrian refugees refusing to live in a particular stretch of St. Louis because it was too scary. That's the stretch. That's your stretch. That's the stretch I grew up in, <laughs> and, and it's it's the stretch that I fictionalize in my works of fiction. You know, my two books of fiction are set right there, right? I just rename it Gateway City. Um, so I don't know. I, I I think I could make the argument that many of the ideas uh, that I have actually originated far from the coast, but in the heart of of North St. Louis. I always give it a shout out. So anti-blackness is not specific to uh, you know white people. Obviously, it exists within other marginalized people as well. Yes. So how do you suggest for people who who want to to be allies with each other um, and make sure that the conversations, particularly regarding like black oppression and issues specifically for the black community, that they aren't being talked over by other marginalized groups? Like often you see the words you know. Like the black community and, and you know people of color being interchanged, but that's not necessarily they're not the same thing that can be mm -hmm. swapped out. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, though, I guess that's a different kind of conversation, and that's a conversation that needs to take place between those ethnic groups. Um, I mean, what what you're making me think of is is in higher education, for example. If you go to any any college or university, usually on the front page, they're going to have a note about diversity somewhere, and they're going to talk about their numbers, and they put us all together. So at Emerson recently, they talked about the numbers. We have more ethnic diversity than we've had in any year. So I actually raised my hand and asked the president. I said, so black males, can we count them on one hand or two? <laughs> right, and he, did, he didn't answer the question, right? So um, I, I think what you're speaking to is critical. There, there are, there's certainly great political utility and people of color thinking of themselves as a single entity great political utility, uh, and that lack of cohesion there is so easily exploited uh, by the majority culture, and we're, we're seeing that in election after election Look at the Harvard well. lawsuit. Yeah. Yes, right, 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 which also has an element of class in it too, right? I mean, which, ha which has to be acknowledged, but um, so those conversations aren't taking place uh, between those communities. Um, we're seeing it with the movement for black lives. I know there was, there was one march uh, here in Boston that uh, my children marched in and they told me about a moment where they, they got to the edge of the highway and they ran into a wall of policemen. And um, the, the group that was in the front was a Latino student group. And I think and my kids are African American. I think they were in the group behind that. And the Latino students turned and faced the crowd and said, white allies to the front, please. And they shifted. And the white allies came because because that makes the police stand down usually, usually, right? It reduces the possibility. Uh, and I saw that as as an example of some conversations are taking place, uh, and to a certain extent, it's generational. I think I think in my generation, uh, those conversations have been rare to our detriment. Well, I got I have a question. Um, you guys, so you you mentioned about children's books. And I'm gonna think, I'm gonna make the assumption that you're somewhat activist type. You know? So, um, have you ever thought of, or as a, I'd like to suggest that, um, to consider take, um, do some research um, on, on uh, elderly, you know, older growing, and also older growing in prison. Um, it's a phenomenon now, you know, from, like I entered the system in the 70s, we got out in the 21st century in 05. And uh, a lot of my contemporaries, uh, you know, just wilting away, dementia, yeah. different things like that. Now looking at it from, you know, like, like a child, you know, uh, I, I've never read any of your books. My first introduction to you, I'm excited about it. It was good to meet you. Um, but um, there's gotta be a story in a narrative and at least a whole lot of wisdom. But I would say that the bottom line too would be about humanity because how can you treat an individual who can't do, who can't walk from here to the bathroom, um, you know, so inhumanely. So if, you know, in using 
but you have. And I know Adrian, uh, I, you know, I've seen your work and I've met you in the past and I know some of the work you've done. Um, it would be interesting, you know, to, um, to at least just think about it, explore it, what can come from it, you know, because you seem like you're an activist from the cradle, you know, and the opposite would be to the grave, so. Well, I, 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 thank you, I thank you for that. And while you were talking, I was trying to think of, of books that already exist that would address those. And I didn't come up with any. It might just be me. So I think you, yeah, usually I can say, no, let me direct you to, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything. So I, I think that's a very good point, a very good suggestion. That, um, I mean, that's often how it starts. You identify a lack. Uh, usually, what gives me hope and, and strength in difficult moments? Um, I have this thing called a commonplace book where I just, I mean, it's like, and I've been doing it for like 20 years. It's just like thoughts uh, from various people, uh, some of whom are direct ancestors and some are ancestors that I claim, intellectual ancestors. And I just go through that and that's sort of like my devotional. Um, like for example, uh, the one that's always at, at the top of the page is by, um, oh, what's that brother's name? Reginald. He was the first black billionaire, Baltimore. Reginald Lewis, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, Reginald Lewis, he, one, one of his is keep going no matter what. That's the whole thing, it's really short. <laughs> but I love it, you know, so it's like, so I, I just have like millions of those. Some of them are long and, you know, three pages long, but some of them are just like, keep going no matter what, right? I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do that today. I've been very interested in the last few years about the um, significance of historical memory in our contemporary world, the notion of remembrance and reverence. And I'm just wondering if your book of essays or anything you've written in the past, I'm sorry, I don't know the work, uh, but I will find out, um, deals with Confederate monuments. This, this is an issue that, that I think resonates through our entire history and yeah. what that means, and I find it really important. Yeah, uh, there's one essay in, in this book, uh, I think it's called uh, Brick Relics. Uh, which touches on that, um, and um, I intend to write more about that, but it's more about historical memory in general. Uh, like, for example, one of, the, one of the things that it pivots on is, is when uh, Michelle Obama made the speech about my daughter's living house that was built by slaves and how quite a few media people just worked really hard to dispute that and, and found that they couldn't. Uh, so I, I, I talk about that, and I talk about particularly um, a local wall. Yeah, I was going to ask, can you talk yeah. about how the opening and how you got into that? Yeah, what, what, what is the... Uh, it's in Medford. Thank you. Uh, I was about to say Milton. It was something with an M. Medford. Yes, there's a wall in, in Medford, and, and I was just riding by. My wife was driving. I was in the car, and I, and I saw a slave wall on the wall, and I was like, did you see that? And she was like, no, I'm, I'm driving. My eyes on the road. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see? <laughs> and I, I said, I think I think I saw a wall. They said slave wall. And so when I got uh, home, you know, I Googled it and I saw it was a slave wall. But they 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 know the name of the man who built the wall. He wasn't he wasn't enslaved. They know the year he he made it. Uh, they even they even know exactly how many enslaved black people were in Medford at the time because Medford Historical Society has done this work. Uh, so I kind of use that as a launching pad to think about historical memory, uh, less about uh, how we wrestle with Confederate uh, memory, but how the narrative changes in terms of the construction of the country. Um, and so one of the points I make, you know, black people angrily say, we, we built this country. So I want to be clear about that. We didn't build it by ourselves. We're not saying no one else <laughs> built it. A lot of people built this country, but what we're arguing about is our role in the construction of the country. It's often minimized or even erased. Uh, and one of the questions I ask in the essay is, if we know the man's name, why is it called Slave Wall? Why isn't his name on the wall, right? Simple question. All right. You may have started to answer this question earlier, but you know, one of the essays is about black fatherhood. Oh, yeah. and, um, and I know you as a colleague and as a mentor to many students. So you, you kind of, I've grown into this, the voice of an elder in, in relation to younger people and you're writing children's books. I wonder how, uh, the things you talked about, the concessions you you catch yourself making, living in a, a black body in white spaces, compromises, and then the resenting of having to make it. How does that translate into conversations that you can have with younger people about how to 
be. If I'm making myself clear, yeah. and yeah. maybe even does that come, does that spill over into the writing for young people? Um, it, it probably doesn't spill over that much into the writing for young people. At least it hasn't so far. The the writing for young people is not remotely as heavy. Generally, it's, it's you know it's primarily to entertain and to make them happy to be alive. Not much more than that, right? Uh, but I think it, uh, what you're talking about. I mean, my wife and I, like I said, we have five children. Four of them are young men. So we've had conversation after conversation. And of course, we've had some dangerous misadventures uh, with police. It's, it's inevitable uh, raising a young black man. I mean, I just don't think, I don't think you can get around it, right? So uh, we've had those conversations often. Sometimes I've been proud of how wise and mature I've been. And sometimes, you know, not so much. Um, I don't think I write about it in this book, but I have written about uh, my oldest son, um, the first time he was surrounded by cops with their guns drawn, um, this was some years ago, uh, and they were looking for a young black man in a hoodie, and he was wearing a hoodie, and he was maybe 17, 18, and I reacted so irrationally at the time, you know, I was just kind of mad at myself later, I took his hoodie, you know, which is a feeble, weak, stupid response, but I was just so mad, just give it to me, just give it to me, and it really had nothing to do. Uh, with the situation. Uh, so yeah, we talk a lot about how to inhabit these bodies. And um, one thing, I, I'm only being half facetious here, but with, with one of my sons, one of the things that he picked up, you never know what they're gonna pick up, right? And I, I told him, well, one, one thing that I do in Washington, D.C., where we were living, where the you know the drivers were really aggressive, and they had those countdowns, right, and you cross the street. I said, I usually try to see if a white woman is crossing the street. And I try to cross the street near her because statistically, a white woman is least likely to be hit. And part of it is I think people realize that statistically, you're most likely to be punished in the criminal justice system if you hit a white woman. If someone runs over me, I tell them, they'll be back on the street tomorrow if they're ever picked up. That's the reality. And so my, my son was waiting for me. At, I was working at the Washington Post at the time, and he was walking from the metro station. And there was a white woman in the crosswalk, so he kind of rushed so that he could be in the crosswalk with her. <laughs> And yeah, he was maybe 13, 14, and, uh, and he startled her. He really startled her, and you know, and he, so, you know, he kind of second-guessed the whole thing. And then he decided to go to uh, Starbucks. This is before we stopped going to Starbucks. This was years ago. So he went to Starbucks. It turns out she was going to Starbucks. So she looks up again, and there he is, and she's increasingly agitated, right? So he, he quickly gets his drink, and he decides he's going to go to the Washington Post and sit on the steps and wait for me. Um, so he's sitting there waiting for me to come out the building and that same white woman comes walking up and she looks up and she's just terrified now because he's sitting on the steps looking in her direction. So it's like somehow she gave him mind control powers. You know, he, he knew where she was going. He was waiting for her. He was gonna, he was gonna harm her, you know, it was just, you know, in front of the security cameras. He wanted to be in a good spot in front of the cameras. And, uh, you know, it was one of those moments where I felt like I had painted myself and him into a corner, <laughs> right? It's like, well, what do you want, Pop? You know, you want me to cross the street when you see a white woman, but you want me to cross the street with a white woman? It gets really complicated. But the fact that you have to think about all of these things all of the time uh, really, you know, it distracts from energy that could be better devoted elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.